and others. We actually have an important meeting later on today on that very topic. Um, there's a lot of details in this report. There's a lot that goes on on a project like this. I think a tremendous amount of progress has been made, um, but we also understand that between now and December Go Live, we have to really be on our game, mm -hmm. uh, and we have to level up in key areas to ensure that we are validating a system and that we're implementing something that, that proves itself to be able to handle the critical payroll role that we need for a system before we go live. And I'm not sure if Deputy Mayor, oh, <laughs> sorry, Deputy Controller. Close enough for government work. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, first two disclaimers. Um, first, uh, my comments, which will be brief, um, are in no way a personal criticism of, of any of the work done, and literally heroic work has been done for us to be at this stage. And second, um, my tremendous regard for my colleague to my right, um, who is providing exemplary leadership on this project. Nonetheless, I think it's important for the committee to understand that this project um, was supposed to go live two years ago. Um, it was supposed to cost $62 million. It's $44 million over budget. Um, that, that's um, a context that I think is important to understand. And it's not the fault of any individuals. It is the fault uh, of systems in our, in our city um, where uh, leadership, and accountability um, are lacking. This, this project was assigned to four different departments. And um, ITA uh, provided, again, heroic um, leadership. But, but that's a very difficult um, project structure to make work. Uh -huh. And um, the result is we, we still, as Ted has um, acknowledged, we're still really um, not in a position to say we can go live uh, in December with confidence that it will all work out. Every effort is being made by all four departments and the five private sector consultants to make this work. We will need more uh, support from the departments uh, who have lots of other things to worry about, mm -hmm. homelessness, crime, etc. But they will worry a lot if their paychecks don't arrive in January or they arrive wrong. Mm -hmm. So we do need their attention and the council understanding the gravity of the challenge and communicating that and the mayor's office communicating that and us in the controller's office communicating that to everyone. <coughs> we, people need to turn their attention to this. They need to be trained on the new system. They can't wait until it goes poorly to say, oh, oh no one told me. That's why I'm being very frank with you mm -hmm. today, is um, people need to be forearmed and forewarned. Um, I would be delighted if um, this turns out to be Y2K, right? That we, we worry a lot, and because we worry a lot, we work very hard, and it turns out to be a big nothing. That would be great, and that is our goal. Yeah. But I'd rather uh, under-promise and over-deliver than over-promise and under-deliver. And a perfect example of that is what Ted alluded to on the fire department. PACER is a custom design system. Workday is a uh, robust system that, that serves more than half of Fortune 500 companies. It's a, it's a powerful technology, but it wasn't designed specifically for the city of Los Angeles like PACER is. And so PACER does things that only PACER can do. And Workday can do anything, but one of the things it does is it's, it's, it stresses accountability. And PACER has made allowances for lack of accountability. So you frankly were misinformed uh, at the last meeting about the, the relationship of Workday to the fire department. Uh, it's not that Workday can't do something, it's that Workday is designed to follow the rules, and the fire department wasn't was making up its own rules for decades, and now they have to follow the rules. There have to be positions available to fill. There weren't positions, so you authorized them. Mm -hmm. But before that, they had no authorization. Um, that doesn't mean that they were doing anything wrong. It means that they had an informal way of working within their budget. Workday makes them operate in a formal way. 
these are the kind of issues, um, so there are two kinds of issues that can crop up in January if we go live. One is technical glitches, and we're doing everything we can to test the system so it is hardwired to work. The other is that um, some people may be overpaid because now the rules are going to be enforced, and some people may be underpaid because now the rules are going to be enforced. And both of them are quite awkward. When people are overpaid, they are really <coughs> unhappy when their check comes in and it's less than they had expected. And they will immediately go to the union and to you and scream bloody murder. Even more awkward is when people have been underpaid, because how long have they been underpaid? And how much do we owe them? And do we go back a year or five years or ten years? So these are challenges that have nothing to do with the technology, but have everything. We, we don't have a, um, a sure um, uh, inventory of all those issues. They may be relatively minor, and we certainly hope so, but um, even one could lead to a lawsuit. And so there are real challenges, and, and all I wanted to do here is to um, underscore mm -hmm. the gravity of the project that we're all working on. Everyone is doing everything they can to have this project um, come good in January and to be a big nothing, to have no one notice that anything changed. Um, but given how the history of this project, none of us can say with confidence that, we're, that we are there yet. And so we will need the understanding and the support of the council and the department heads to make sure that this is a success. Thank you. Really, really well said. <clears throat> but for clarity, are you suggesting that we that we collectively are doing the right things right now? And we have to keep our, you know, nose to the grindstone, keep our eye on the ball. Or are you suggesting there are things in training, in preparation, in discipline that we need to implement now to be ready by December? Um, not to be cute, um, Mr. Chairman, but both. I mean, I think, <laughs> I think we are doing everything we can. Uh, the question is uh, really uptake by the departments. Right. I think um, the mayor's, um, uh, at least at, in terms of our budget, the mayor's been, been very supportive. And so the budget that will be delivered to the council um, ensures that the resources are there uh, mm -hmm. to do this right. The question is, what, is anyone paying attention, right? So you have training. Do people show up? Are they engaged? Do they go back? Do they, do they work hard on these things? Mm -hmm. If they do, will be in good shape. If, if they, because of 17 other distractions, um, uh, don't pay much attention to this until January, uh, then all of the, this good effort will, um, will still run into problems. Thank you. Does that make sense? It does make sense, yeah. If, if I may, Ted Ross with ITA. The, I think the key comes down to checkpoints and milestones. To Rick's point, when we're a good example is end-to-end -end training halfway through phase one of end-to-end -end training we identified we weren't going to make it so we changed our strategy and it was only by closely observing every single day of activity and then making a pivot did it, did, did we follow up on that so i think to to the strategic point um rick's uh, concerns or or uh, we either build confidence or lose confidence on any given milestone when we assess where we're at so testing is a great example you know we're every day assessing are we getting the right people to really test this system I hate to bring in 250 of the wrong people because I'm really not accomplishing what I want to accomplish who participated how well did they participate and did we get through our test scripts that right there at the end of that milestone tells us whether we were successful or not in that area Training is another great example. We're right now in the process of building our training materials. But to Rick's point, how are departments participating? Are they attending? Where do we stand? These are all metrics and items that are in some of these recommendations that we are incorporating. So maybe as a suggestion to this body is we could provide additional information as really where the key milestones are. Mm -hmm. Because like Rick, I, we work extremely hard to make this successful. But we know that hard work alone doesn't do it. 
we need to look at the numbers. We need to see how are we training well? Are we testing well? Are we, are we getting our conversion done well? And so we have milestones in the project. We call it go, no go decisions where we get to a certain point and say, did we do that well enough? Can we now proceed? So I have a lot of confidence personally in a December 2023 go live based on the nature of the work. But that is not a glide path. It's not like we're just on autopilot and then mm -hmm. we're just going to end up landing. We have to handle every checkpoint well. We have to assess every checkpoint. And we will be honest with this body and with others if we have failed in a checkpoint. Because the last thing we're going to do, and, and insert name here on payroll systems or major system projects that has failed, we are not going to go live with a system that does not work. We have seen it with Department of Water and Power. We have seen it with LA Unified School District. The City of Los Angeles is not going to do that. So our key is that we've got timeline between now and go live. We have our work cut out for us. And I think from our perspective, every checkpoint has measurements that <coughs> could be provided and published mm -hmm. to assess the success or the failure as to where we are in those checkpoints. And I think that's how we're managing the project now. Members, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I appreciate the presentation from, uh, from both uh, Ms. Ross, Mr. Cole. Commitment and you intensely to this. Uh, you referenced, though, uh, Mr. Cole, that we were millions of dollars over budget and years behind the schedule. Uh, principally because of why? Uh, city employees have not been uh, cooperating, not been following through, or the, the, the system that we, that we put together has been flawed. What, what's the cause of the well, first of all, for context, Council Member, I've never seen uh, an IT project, and I'm a veteran of many of them, <laughs> that um, arrived on time, uh, didn't cost more than originally anticipated, and deliver less than originally. Uh, this is um, an outlier in terms of, um, I think it's uh, a much bigger changeover than most cities and, and, and most operations. Um, to your question, uh, that's outlined to some degree in, in the report in some detail, but the, I think the three most important points was, one, not having um, a clear um, project management um, uh, captain, if you will. Uh, ITA sort of stepped into that role uh, because it, what, it didn't exist, and I think um, uh, they, they, they deserve credit for trying. Um, but I think they were, they were not seated that, that role uh, by everybody, and therefore um, it wasn't until KPMG was brought on board last year that, that there was a clear captain uh, to say, okay, we, we've got four different departments, they're saying four different things, here's where we're going to go. So that's one is I think the project um, had a, a, a flawed structure to begin with. Um, the second is I think this project, unfortunately, um, was ill-conceived at the beginning to be a replacement of PACER versus the implementation of a modern payroll system, a pay, pay, payroll system and HR system, right? Those are two different things. One, one is to, to, to digitize inefficiency, and the other is to enter the modern 21st century. And I think, um, I think the, the city of Los Angeles was so used to PACER that the idea was, what, what can we do to bring in something that will exactly um, mimic what PACER does, but without all of the, the problems of a custom system maintained by um, a person who, you know, is sort of mission critical. And um, so, so I think had the project been, had we started and taken a look at our business practices, for example, council member, we have, uh, I'm told, 1,600 pay grades. Mm -hmm pay codes, um, th that's um, a grotesque absurdity, right? We, we have 1,600 different ways of paying people in the city of Los Angeles and trying to program <coughs> even a modern robust system um, to take a, into account shift differentials, bilingual pay, um, advanced education, longevity, uh, on and on and on, uh, and try to get all that to the penny um, versus trying to clean up some of that stuff at the outset. And that's a great opportunity that I think we missed. Um, the third reason I think it, it, it took so long um, is I, I'm not sure that there has been, um, how can I say this accurately, um, I'm not sure that there has been awareness 
an oversight uh, of, the, of the criticality of this project, right? And that sounds like I'm blaming someone. I'm not. I think that there's a lot going on in this city. And this is just one of the many things going on in this city. And I don't think it got enough attention early on enough um, to, to, be, to understand the magnitude of its impact. You've been getting monthly reports on this project. Um, I don't mean you personally, but I mean the committee. Um, and if you read down and read between the lines, there's a lot of yellow and red um, on those dashboards. And um, I think it's important to be on top of these things. Um, and there have been a lot of other things that people have been focused on. I think you, ref you reference the fact that the system is being used by Fortune 1000. Any other municipalities? Use it? It's a good point. Um, it, they are, they are um, entering into the field of, of um, public sector. So they've done states, counties, and cities. But I think we're, well, undoubtedly we're the biggest city, right, because we're the second biggest city in the country. But um, it has not been, it was not designed for um, the public sector. Um, but again, the public sector has some unusual approaches to, to pay and, and benefits um, that's much more complicated uh, than, than the typical private sector company. So they've had some successes, and they've also had some, some pretty spectacular fails, and the failure is not with the technology. The failure is to marry one way of handling payroll with um, the, the sort of state of the art. And if you try to, try to mix those two, it's, it can be challenging. There have been lawsuits, I think, in, in Oregon and, and Baltimore. Um, but workday is not the problem. I think the problem is understanding that a modern payroll system needs to have a modern payroll structure. And we have a, we don't have a modern payroll structure. We, you know, our, our civil service system is embedded in our charter. It's 100 years old. Mm -hmm. And if I may add one point, um, it, it's hard to underestimate the power of COVID in that conversation. Mm -hmm. This project was years in the making. We have a contract and we officially started a project March 2020. Mm -hmm. Well, that happens to be the same month as the stay at home order. Uh, and so in the beginning of the project, many things people pivoted to do digitally and they were effective at it. But certain aspects like system testing, et cetera, they just do not work remotely. And so the project started to run into serious issues with that. Secondly, we had things like the separation incentive program. We lost HR professionals who retired during that time frame. We ha were on our heels. The personnel department was working through disaster service workers and COVID vaccinations and a whole series of issues while trying to build it. So we had a year and a half, two years of full-time effort reacting to a once in a generation type of pandemic um, that it really just seriously affects the ability to try to implement a large, complicated project. Very good points, and, and I, I should have incorporated them in my answer as well. We're both responses were very good. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, very complete. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question uh, and a comment. Uh, so numerous times it was mentioned that the tech, like, I think, Rick, you mentioned it, and even Ted, that the, that's not the technology is the issue. So but rather the training and, and sort of the, the way the, it sounds like a lot of it sounds like the culture of how things have been done in the city. Okay. So what are, what are the, what are y'all doing to address that? Because I can't imagine 41,000 employees uh, now sort of the onus is on them to do a lot of it, maybe department heads and HR department. So like, can you speak to that and how you're trying to, to change that? Because I think that's the, the thing that I find the hardest right now. Yeah, top to bottom and bottom to top. And so, you know, I, uh, as Rick knows, I take a lot of responsibilities on myself. So I don't, I don't feel like it's okay for me to say, I've given you the system, now it's for you to figure out. It's, it's like handing someone a car, not teaching them how to drive. So from our perspective, from a project perspective, it's, it's tenacious project management so that when items get identified as decisions that need to be made, we as a team, regardless of department, sit down and make those decisions. We frequently run into a systems project in which decisions get kicked down the road. And there's a lot of times where staff will say, well, that's above my pay grade. But at some point, everyone's saying something's above their pay grade, and we need to make determinations and decisions on that. So aggressive project management ensures that we are configuring and changing the system the way we need to. From the user perspective, there's so many different great ways of approaching training. You know, one of the reasons why I work 
RFP was selected by the seven departments who chose it in the RFP was its usability. And so while it is a system in which there's increased interactions maybe compared to PACER, it's a system that, you know, USC and the city of Denver and Orlando and Dallas and others have leveraged and be able to take advantage of. And the way you do it is you train them multiple ways and in different facets. You do some things in person with user labs where someone could touch it and be able to answer a question then and there. You have videos, you have in-person trainings, you have uh, uh, situations where people actually get in the system and try it out in a in a, like a sandbox environment. So for us, we think it's like a multifaceted approach to say, here's what's expected of you, here's how it works, here's how you get assistance, here's the opportunities to practice it. And, and I think one of the benefits of it is we saw during COVID, COVID forced many of us to do things that we weren't familiar with doing and to get good at it. And I think what we saw is that if we give people the, the, the training, if we give them the lifeline, if we give them the assistance, and then we help people who are maybe struggling you know, along the edges of it, then we can get people to make that migration, as I think we've seen even during the COVID pandemic. So there's no one size fits all answer. Um, of those 41,000 people, uh, the vast majority don't have to interact with it every day. But for those who do, we're there to assist and participate and make sure that they know how to accomplish it. So I think it's a, a lengthy answer to a simple question. Mm -hmm. At the risk of lengthening the answer, uh, mm -hmm. Council Member, um, two things. One, first of all, I agree with, with everything that um, Ted has said about the challenge. I would add two additional things. One is I think we, we, we need to engage more effectively with um, what we always call our labor partners um, because they represent the vast majority of those 41,000 uh, or 49,000 is how many checks we, we issue. Um, and uh, they will be the first people that, that folks will go to if they have concerns. And so I think we, and, and to be fair, um, we're incorporating those efforts to, to reach out. And I know all of you um, understand the importance of that, and I hope that you can reinforce that. Mm -hmm. The second, though, is a bigger answer, Council Member, which is um, there are a lot of challenges with the culture of this organization. And um, the city has systematically um, not fixed its streets and not fixed its sidewalks. That's highly noticeable. You, you notice the potholes. You notice the broken sidewalks. The city's also systematically underinvested in training and, and development. And that's not noticeable, um, except in situations like this. Um, that, that it's, it's an invisible breakdown. And um, there are departments in this city that have no training budget. There are, there are departments in the city that simply rely on online training catalog from, from the personnel department without incorporating that. 4,000 new people since um, uh, May of last year. Those people are replacing people who had deep institutional 30 and 40 year careers in the city. We have 4,000 brand new people Where's the onboarding? Where's the training? Where's the career development? Where's the pre preparation for them to have 30 and 40 year satisfying careers? The Target Local Hiring Program is a fantastic program, but, it, but if we're bringing in people uh, at that entry level, how are we developing them to be able to be the foremen and the supervisors and the middle managers and ultimately the department heads in this city? So that's, I hope, um, broader than this topic, mm -hmm. but I hope a, a topic that the, the personnel uh, audit and hiring committee will, will make a major focus because it is a crisis in the city. There are a lot of visible crises, homelessness, public safety, infrastructure. This is an invisible crisis of the talent to fix those other issues. And unless we invest in the people in this organization who um, consume 70 percent of the resources, right? We're paying people to do the jobs. We need to train them and we need to build structures where they're empowered to make good decisions and not have to say, well, that's, that's above my pay grade and not be able to act. Um, that, that's a deep and important issue for the committee to tackle because I don't think it's being uh, addressed uh, in terms of the gravity of the challenge. You know, as, as someone who came from a, a workplace that all we did was training, right? That's all we did. Uh, and that's why, you know, our housekeepers and dishwashers can lead campaigns and do so much, right? 
I think that's like the, to me the most important thing. But I, I hope maybe there's an opportunity now uh, if you're in sort of a, a moment where people need to rise to the occasion. I think people are out there willing to take leadership. Uh, and I think the other thing is, is I'm always a big fan of, of tracking everything, right? Uh, just to use an example of we need to, we need to have an if a worker has to go and update their uh, emergency contact, well, how many of them have done it, right, in each department? Like I, the, having those numbers, I think for me, helps, helps me be more helpful. Uh, you know, I don't know what other sort of benchmarks you have, but those numbers, the numbers don't lie. They don't tell the full story, but they don't lie. Right, and so having that, I think, would be helpful to to zero in on certain on other on certain things. And you know, uh, it sounds. I'm glad to hear there's a captain now. That was one of my first questions. Thank you, Councilmember Price, because uh, you know accountability is the most important thing, right? Uh, so sounds like you're the captain now, uh, Ted. The reality is, I don't mind owning this at all. But what we're leveraging is we're leveraging KPMG for some day-to-day -day project management, so that they've been extremely helpful in that regards. So they're your they're your uh, your assistant coach, it sounds like. It is truly an army, um, but armies need generals and they need colonels and they need captains, and so there's a lot of leadership being provided at a lot of levels. But you know, I think you know you see us here sitting before you. Understanding most executives don't understand this level of depth. We're in meetings every week, multiple meetings per week on this topic because of the gravity and the importance of this project. Well, I'm, I'm got to. And, and to I want to acknowledge um, in the audience is James Robinson, um, our division head for uh, accounting operations, who's providing <clears throat> um, on the on the ground um, leadership on this. And, uh, and the same is true in personnel and CAO and ITA. Mm -hmm. There's some, the, the best people are working uh, to make this work. Great, thank you. So <clears throat> I'm sure we're going to have more discussions like this, but uh, for now, in the interest of time, I think I will see if uh, we're ready to receive and file this report. And unless there's other questions, I don't mean to cut it off. No. Without objection, we'll receive and file. Thank you very much, really appreciate it. Um, it does occur to me at this moment, I'm going to pull out my best Tom LaBange and say that talking about uh, payment systems, this uh, just recently, uh, Tony Miera Sr., who is a giant in the city of Los Angeles history, who served several controllers as a chief deputy city controller, was a man responsible from the payroll for years and years and years. And he was a great example of someone who was with the city for 40, 45 years and single-handedly kept uh, payroll system together up until the, the early 2000s. And so God rest his soul, we're moving into the future. Um, next, um, I think we have to do a, a reconsider item number one, because I think I called for an approval of that, but we need, we actually need to reconsider and make a motion to, re to um, receive and file that report, right? So if there's no objections, we'll reconsider item number one, and we need to receive and file the 12-19-2022 report and approve the 12-24-2023 report as amended. Is there a, a second for that motion? I'll second. A motion made and second without objection. That'll be the order. Let's take item number um, seven and eight together. I think that makes sense. Could you read both of those into the record? Item seven and eight, um, personnel department reports in response to a motion, concurrence to do. Harris Dawson, relative to impediments that delay the hiring individuals through target local hiring program. And item eight, personnel department report relative to the implementation benchmarks and hiring goals of the target local hiring program. Great, thank you very much. Um, I, we're joined here by a CIO and personnel, and could you, if you don't mind, could you give a quick overview of both seven and eight? Yeah, sure. So good afternoon, council members. My name is Alexis Nakamura with the personnel department. Um, the personnel department was instructed to report back on actions taken to address the delays that occur in the hiring of the TLH with TLH employees. Candidates can currently obtain interview and resume training um, from the workforce centers and the community-based organizations that we partner with. And the personal department is currently working on additional interview preparation resources to further support our TLH candidates. 
To mitigate the effects of low response rates to referrals, the personnel department has taken several steps, including providing supplemental names to city, city departments as needed, uh, providing large referral lists upon request that city departments can use to fill current and future vacancies instead of smaller multiple lists to fill vacancies as they come up, uh, gathering feedback from candidates who fail to report to referrals, piloting recorded interviews, and allow allowing city departments to eliminate interviews and participating in hiring events that offer on, on site interviews and conditional job offers. Um, and I'm available to answer any questions regarding our report back. Uh, thank you very much. I'll actually, I turn to my members first. Uh, questions? Yeah, how, how, do you, how do we know we're, uh, we're hiring the right uh, applicants without face to face uh, contact? Is, uh, how important is that in, in the process? So we've been encouraging um, the elimination of interviews mostly for the vocational worker hiring. Um, not all departments are engaging in that. They are still continuing with interviews. It was just one suggestion to try to speed up the process, knowing that we have them, um, you know, they're exempt for pretty much that first year. And so there's time to assess them as they're, as they're working and make adjustments. No, I think it's a good idea. I think it's, it's Supplement what we're doing. Uh, also, with the, what's our what's our policy on on uh, on uh, making offers on site uh, during uh, recruitment process or, or a drive? What's our what's our philosophy? What's our theory? What kinds of positions can we bring people on in immediately? That's something more new. That's not typical. Uh, but we did start doing it. Um, I think the first time we saw it was with the recent public works job fair. Um, so. They did the interview, they get a conditional job, and it's just a conditional job offer. So at that point, you know, they still have to go through backgrounds in medical and they still have to clear. Any early reports on how successful it's been? I don't, that was pretty recent, so I'm not sure if any of them have even started yet. You might have a comment here. Sorry, Cynthia okay. Fletes is gonna um, chime in. Like this with the personnel department. Um, mm -hmm. As Alexis mentioned, the first time we piloted on site interviews as well as same day conditional job offers was at the March 2023 uh, Public Works Job Fair. At that event, 86 individuals were scheduled for on site interviews, which resulted in approximately 36 um, conditional job offers to candidates that attended the event. And when is the next uh, effort like that going to occur? Scheduled yet, or we are working with the Board of Public Works um, to support them at an upcoming event approximately in June 2023, so in just a few months. Um, we also partner with various city departments to attend any hiring events or efforts that they may wish us to attend um, and provide the same type of support. I just encourage you to uh, you know, reach out to community based organizations in that process, they can also help. Yes, absolutely. Ready, willing, and able to work. Just to get opportunities. Congrats on that episode. I think I, um, I will echo my colleagues' um, you know obvious uh, um, approval of such a process. Uh, let's let's keep pursuing the opportunity to make these conditional offers. I mean, it's uh, I think it's a great opportunity for us to bring somebody in and get to know them while they're in the TLH program. Can you? Um, uh, just reflect on uh, a question that came up tangentially earlier uh, about DWP, but I'll add airport and harbor. Are they participating in, in TLH? Harbor and um, airports is actually one of our largest user departments. Uh -huh. um, so we do see that LAWA uses a targeted local hire program um, quite often. As it relates to the Department of Water and Power, we are happy to resume conversations with them and see how they might be able to benefit from using the targeted local did you say port too, though? Yes. And port, port as well is participating? Yes, port does participate. Great, thank you. Questions? Yeah, uh, just a few questions. You, uh, at the last uh, fair, you said 80, 86 people showed up? Is, is that the public structure? 86 individuals um, participated in on site interviews. Um, that does not include uh -huh. individuals that attended to simply um, gain an understanding of the program or who signed up for future orientations at the WorkSource Centers. How many people showed up? As a menace, you know. We'd have 
have to um, report back on the total number. Um, but for the event, um, there was approximately over 3,000 individuals that participated. Wow. So it, uh, just to, just my part of my ignorance. So 3,000 people show up. How do you decide 86 get interviewed? That's a great question. Um, for the specific targeted local hire program on-site interviews and Bridge to Jobs program on-site yes. interviews, individuals who are already part of the program candidate pools um, were invited to participate in the on-site interviews. Mm -hmm. So those individuals already in the pools were the ones who were um, invited to, to participate in the on-site interviews. All other individuals received information about the program. Um, some heard about the program for the first time and were able to sign up for an orientation at their local work source center. Gotcha. And uh, so I'm familiar with this piece that the work source centers have like these, how big is that pool right now? And did we do outreach for them? Because I think it would have been a, uh, we have, I don't know, 5,000 people in that pool, just some sort of uh, directed outreach where there's phone call, letter, and be like, hey, come get interviewed right now on the spot. Is there anything like that happen? Yeah, we used um, emails and text messages to inform nice. candidates who were selected um, about their on-site interview. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Quick question on um, uh, part -time, current part-time employees. If a current part-time employee is on our books and working seasonally, intermittently, but also qualifies for TLH, can they come in through TLH to, for full-time employment? Current part-time or exempt city employees are able to participate in the TLH program. Um, they may obtain a referral form which certifies that they are job ready directly from their employing department, which allows them to skip the job readiness assessment, um, which is normally conducted for non-city employees by one of our partner community-based organizations. Um, from there, they enter the candidate pool, uh -huh. and at that point, they have the same opportunity as any other candidate in the pool um, to be randomly selected for referral to a city department. So would a department like Rec and Parks, for example, as a matter of course, look at its, just as an example, look at its, you know, X number of part-time employees, and would they automatically certify folks for TLH, or does that candidate have to come to, the, come to their supervisor, know about the opportunity, come to their supervisor and say, can you certify me? This may vary from department to department, but generally um, employees have to express interest in the program in order to obtain that referral form. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, members? Other comments on the, we're reporting both on uh, seven and eight. Um, hearing none, then I will um, recommend that we receive and file the reports on item number seven and item number eight together. Very good. Council Member McOsker? Yes. Councilmember Price? Aye. And Councilmember Soto Martinez? Yes. Also, Mr. Chair, returning to item three, just briefly, <laughs> uh, we didn't really do a formal vote on that. Uh, we should, at this point, take a roll call to. Go right ahead. Councilmember McOsker? Yes. Councilmember Price? Yes. And Councilmember Soto Martinez? Yes. Very good. Thank you. We are now to item number nine. And this is an item I just wanted to make brief remarks on. Um, the, uh, the intent with um, item number nine is to get a, just get a report department by department on where we are with um, uh, vacancy rates, which we know anecdotally, at least from my perspective, are high. Just like to see them across the board. And um, thank you very much, uh, Council Member Soto Martinez, for seconding this motion. Uh, I think our intent with this is to also um, uh, fold into, particularly into the budgeting process, um, uh, an opportunity to look at uh, incentives for civilians to see whether or not it makes sense uh, either across the board, but probably not across the board, or department by department to look at, you know, opportunities to incent folks to come to us, uh, to um, go through the process, to hang in there for the process, to get a job with us and stay with us. And so this is something that I think is it would be important uh, from our perspective on this committee, but also important to fold into the budgeting process. Other comments or thoughts? I just want to say, could not be more supportive of this. Uh, you know, I think we heard this for other departments, but let's look at, see what we can do to other places, uh, especially in the places, broken sidewalks or <laughs> our intersections, right, sanitation, there's so much need in the city, so I'm very happy to, to have second this. Thank you. Hearing no other comments then, uh, we'll call the roll call. Uh, yes. Councilmember Oscar? Yes. Councilmember Price? Aye. And 
Councilmember Soto Martinez. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any other business before us today? Uh, that clears the desk, Mr. Chair. Thanks very much, members. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Jason. Thank you. Speech yesterday. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Knocked it out of the park. So now she's really 